Flo, how's the evening going to take place? Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Unfair Club, or welcome if it's your first time here. Um, I commend you for battling Storm Jocelyn to reach us here on Old Queen Street. And as you can see, we are a very full house tonight, extremely full, in fact. Um, this event sold out perhaps quicker than any event we've ever had before. So thank you for all getting here. And do make space for the person next to you if they're looking a little squash. Um, just some housekeeping before we begin. Um, before Freddie introduce our esteemed guests, I just wanted to say that the bar will be open in the interval of this show, which will last about 15 minutes for you to go and get a drink after about 45 minutes of chat between all of us here. And then the restaurant downstairs is open after if you want some delicious food. It is available there until late. So do come and join us for some food down there afterwards. Um, I'm going to be the voice of the voiceless tonight and be keeping a close eye on the words of our subscribers in the live stream chat. Uh, they will have their own questions and comments, which hopefully I'll be able to chip in with and we can keep the ball rolling with both you lovely people in person and also the thousands of people joining across the world wide web. It's subscriber only for people asking questions, and so even more reason to become a member of the Unheard family. If you haven't already subscribed, then of course you must. Um, and with that, I will leave you in the capable hands of Freddie Sayers. Thank you, and welcome once again, everyone. This is our first emergency debate. Uh, what, what is the emergency, you might ask? We've known that there are issues to do with the universities for some time. It felt to us like the departure of Claudine Gay and Liz McGill, the presidents of two of the top Ivy League colleges in the US, was somehow a significant moment because it meant <laughs> that rather than there being kind of grumbles from groups about the issues in university campuses, whether they are free speech, whether they are strange ideologies stalking the campuses, uh, whether it's DEI, whether it's uh, mob culture, whatever, you, whatever your particular issue of concern, suddenly, literally, the presidents of two of the top universities in the world had to resign. So we, we had to ask the question, how bad has it got? Are these places, which need to be a crucible of our culture, taking forward the best, have they somehow been lost? Have they been captured? And what can we do about it? We have gathered at this short notice three uh, people who have very close experience of exactly these issues. They are all philosophers, as it happens, uh, which we'll probably talk about. Uh, all academic renegades of some kind. Uh, Peter Bogosian uh, was the assistant professor of philosophy at Portland State University until he was forced out by campus politics. He's famous, most famous, I should say, for a series of hoax academic papers that he put together with some colleagues, which he submitted to highly prestigious academic peer-reviewed journals, and many of them got published. Uh, titles included Rape Culture and Queer Performativity at the Dog Park, uh, the conceptual penis as a social construct and an ethnography of restaurant masculinity. Um, these all got the thumbs up from the Academy, so he can tell us about that. Uh, welcome, Pete. Kathleen Stock is a former professor of philosophy at the University of Sussex, author of the bestseller Material Girls, and most importantly for us, star columnist here at Unheard. She also was pushed out of her position at Sussex in 2021 because of her writing and views on sex and gender. And James Orr um, was, uh, sorry, is, and this is crucial. <laughs> <laughs> He's still got it. Um, me already. Assistant Professor of Philosophy of Religion at the University of Cambridge. And that is actually crucial because he is our insider tonight. Uh, he, is, he is going to report from inside the citadel as to whether the situation can, in fact, be rescued. Um, so really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. James. I thought the simplest place to start, the rough format, um, as Flo mentioned, is we'll talk for the first 45 minutes or so. There'll be a short break, and then all of your questions, we will get involved after that. Let's start in our bit by identifying the problem, and then we can see if we think it's solvable or not. Pete, that extraordinary uh, experience you had, put getting all of those what frankly sound like crazy papers published, yeah. what did you learn from it, and how bad is the situation? Well, the situation is that the peer-reviewed academic literature is corrupt. There's a wide-scale institutional and organizational corruption. And that, the source of that corruption are there, there are activist disciplines that are not interested in truth. They're not putting forth ideas that are falsifiable, capable, 
capable of being shown false, but they want to push a narrative. They want to push ideas about race, gender, sexual orientation, trans status, etc. So tonight we're going to primarily talk about plagiarism. And yes, plagiarism is a, is a kind of fraud and it's extraordinarily important to talk about. And I predict over the next few months, in fact, I, don't, I know for a fact over the next few months, you're going to see hundreds if not thousands eventually of dissertations that will be proven to be plagiarized. One of the things that we should also talk about is the source of institutional corruption in which the universities are attempting to hide those dissertations. They're attempting to take off people's names from the diversity, equity, inclusion, so you can't find those dissertations. So that's one problem. So you have the problem of plagiarism, the problem of university administrators knowing that their faculty have plagiarized. So instead of saying, okay, let's hold people accountable, they're hiding the dissertations and they're making it almost impossible to get those. And then the final thing is, what I really don't want to be lost in this conversation tonight is that there are disciplines that are not rigorous, they're not sound, they're putting forth ideological conclusions, and then those conclusions are going on to inform public policy. And so in the conversation tonight, I don't want that to get lost because plagiarism is just one part of the whole scale corruption. What kind of disciplines are you talking about? Is a general rule anything that ends in the word studies? <laughs> Black studies, gay studies, women's studies, Chicano studies, Latinx studies, indigenous studies, these are fat studies, these are activist disciplines that promote certain views of reality and then go on to inform public policy. Right. On the topic of plagiarism, just before we move down the line, as yeah. it were, you know something about it because th that's one of the ways they sort of convicted you, wasn't it? Yeah, Tell I'm, I'm a that. plagiarist. I'm, I'm a plagiarist. I have, I have plagiarized. Um, I admitted to plagiarize. I plagiarized Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Uh, I admitted, you should probably explain the context. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as part of the exposure of, of academic corruption, we submitted, we wrote 20 bogus, ridiculous, and quite frankly, vile papers, and we submitted them to a number of uh, journals, the top in their fields. And among uh, the papers is... We, we, we plagiarized Adolf, a chapter from Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. We had two, one and we took out, we took out Jew and we put in white male, and then the other one we just rewrote some of the words. And just for the record, I was actually, they brought me up on charges of plagiarism. I completely pled guilty to it, and then, I mean, it's black and white, I play plagiarized, and then they said, you're not guilty. And the reason, <laughs> the, the reason that they said that I was not guilty is because if they found me guilty, then the journal would have published Mein Kampf. The, right, mm. the very journals whose narratives they want to forward about power dynamics and race, and you know, for example, racism being the ordinary every, everyday state of affairs, etc. So I'm I'm the only plagiarist on the panel. Well, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, so far, <laughs> can I just jump to to James because I feel like you mm. will have a, a, a different sense of where the problem is? I mean, if, if I ask you that question, what are you most worried about? What mm. do you think the problem is? Mm. Well, I don't think it's plagiarism. I mean, that's been the kind of the immediate trigger for this debate and a lot of the discussions in the United States. I mean, I don't think, I think they're sort of m missing the target if plagiarism is, is the sort of, is, is the key theme. Um, nor is it, I think, a problem of really aff affirmative action. I mean, the, the problem was that the president of Harvard was the top DEI commissar uh, head of the Office for Diversity, which she basically spearheaded and was the, the architect of, that she was appointed in the first place to run the most influential, arguably the most famous and, and, and the wealthiest university uh, in the world. So that's that sort of, I think, getting the plagiarism stuff, I think, is unhelpful. And I, maybe there is a big problem in the United States and in higher education in the UK. My suspicion is, is probably not. I mean, I think the sort of deterrence... The incentive structures are, 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 are sort of well in place, uh, and I think plagiarism is, is not, not really the problem. I mean, inevitably, in a culture that prizes intellectual conformity and groupthink, everything is plagiarised. <laughs> in a way, you have to sort of signal conformity to an ideology through by taking out the kind of the woke idiolect and, you know, always looking at any problem, whether it's in history or law or sociology, through a pretty, an increasingly narrow ideological prism. So to that extent, you know, there's an awful lot of plagiarism around. A, or at least there's not very, very little originality, very, very, very little novelty. So what is the problem? 
Well, I think the key problem, I mean, it depends what you think universities are for. I mean, in terms of research and education, it's clear there's a, there is a serious problem. And it's not just because of the Mickey Mouse disciplines that are, that are sort of engulfing the uh, less selective and, and sort of cheap, cheaper universities in the UK. Uh, and the US. It's, it's also the sort of the main disciplines are being corrupted. So, I mean, you know, and, and maybe corruption is too strong a word, but I mean, take something like, uh, I don't know, law, you know, jurisprudence. There, there's going to be, an, you know, a, a, a dominant orthodoxy in favour of some kind of judicial activism. The idea this sort of will be producing graduates in law who will basically think of the courts as an agent for a certain kind of social engineering. Now, there are perfectly, there's a perfectly reasonable case to be made for that within academia. But what you're seeing is a sort of spiralling effect on those kinds of issues. And similarly in English, you know, there's clearly a preponderance towards, even in the very best English departments, there's clearly a, prepon a, sort, of, a sort of leaning towards looking at literature through post-colonial lenses or through, through feminist lenses or trans lenses, whatever it might be. And now that's, you know, that's OK. There's, there's, you don't really want to root all of that out. But it's clear that the balance is, so is, is out, of, out of kilt. Is it uh, the uniformity? that troubles you? Or is it the sense that there's not neutrality, that it's sort of become activist as an institution? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a mixture of both. I mean, so institutions are dropping their commitment to neutrality on issues that really they shouldn't be expressing any views on at all. So we saw this over the, the, in the wake of the George, George Floyd uh, affair in, in 2020. Uh, you know, long, long statements of kind of institutional genuflection. Uh, you know, fast forward, you know, the, the Gaza, Gaza last year, in like October, then there was a kind of deafening silence by, by contrast. So there's an abandonment of institutional neutrality. And in the sort of pursuit of these kind of organising horizons of diversity, inclusion and, and equality, there is clearly a chilling effect on those who would want to challenge uh, uh, research looked at on, through, through those lenses. So there's a kind of official version of what, what is good and de deviants from it are excluded or... Absolutely. Heterodoxy is effectively held in, 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 in deep suspicion. It doesn't pay to be heterodox, as, it, as used to be the case. Um, and so... So yeah. you, it's not a left-right thing for you especially that, that you think it's become kind of captured by far-left ideology, especially even though you might be considered a conservative you would like to see more balance or, or more diversity of opinion. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, the group, you know, there are sort of tipping points. And once groupthink gets beyond a certain, you know, I think an intellectual culture where you've got maybe a spread of 70, 30 on a contentious issue would be absolutely fine. Uh, but where you're getting, you know, 80, 20, you can suddenly get a sort of spiralling effect where the minority is just not, the social costs are just going to be too high yeah. to speaking out. And that really matters where the issues are of clear public concern. So just think of the last few years of COVID and lockdowns, climate, race, gender critical beliefs, et cetera, et cetera, bioethics. All of these areas are the, area, are the kind of the no-go areas, precisely the areas that universities should be steering the public on, difficult ethical is, uh, areas, difficult technical areas. And that's, we, you know, the, with the public university is failing in its job to the taxpayer and to the general public to, to, to perform that vital so you're service. Sort of, you're, you're doing your bit in real life here because you've you've come out as a conservative pretty much I would say in the last two or three years in particular and yet you're at the heart of a very prestigious institution Cambridge what's life like as oh. a, a, a dissident from the dominant orthodoxy life is pretty good actually I mean I should <laughs> say I've I've had no problems at all from the university itself as is often the case, I mean, there, there's a kind of disproportionately vocal minority among the students, among some colleagues. Um, and so there are, there are kind of tantrums about various things I do or various people I invite or various things I say. Jordan Peterson, for example. Right. But that, and that was good to make an important point. After, after a number of colleagues cancelled him, it was important to get him back. And so and there was no, no adverse consequences at all to, to doing that and a number of other things that... I've done it, have, have you know, passed without without much you know consequence, and so. So they don't tuck in the corridors and in the cloisters. <laughs> you don't get no eye doubt. rolls in the oh, canteen. I'm sure, I'm sure I get an awful lot of that, but I'm pretty immune to it. And um, what the interesting thing is that there isn't, you know, the, the, the group think is kind of illusory. I mean, what you've got is 
the radical vocal minority. And then you've got a sort of, then you have, you know, two conservatives, maybe. I mean, I, you know, I could count on one hand the number of people I've met in Cambridge who, who sort of share my basic outlook on the world. But you've got this middle silenced majority who just really want to get on with their lives and don't, you know, d d you know are, are worried about social ostracism and will and will and will and will keep quiet. But that, so you basically, it's the, the classic. Um, it's it's a classic example of all totalitarian regimes. You, there's a, there's a brittleness to them. I mean, if you think of, uh, I don't know, if you if you imagine yourself being in in Berlin in early 1989 and, and telling somebody, you know, in 10 months' time, all of this is going to be over. You know, nobody would have believed you. But the ideology was very brittle. No one really believed it. Uh, and so the sort of you know stated preferences are very very different from revealed preferences when an ideology when you get these sorts of purity spirals and so it could be that this this comes to an end and if it does come to an end it would, that it would come to an end very quickly. So there's some hints of optimism there but that we'll come back to. Kathleen, you've obviously been at the sharp end of this. Um, I think it'd be really helpful just to start with that. You know, your, your the experience you had at Sussex was was a sort of um, ideology and an an enforcement of that ideology that led to you not being able to work there anymore? Um, was it groupthink? Was it meanness? What was it? No, it was very much like James just said, I think, although it's impossible to get people to say this, but I think most people were either neutral or vaguely um, for me. Like, occasionally people would come up and whisper to me, keep going, you know, things like that. But um, there's a small group of extremely vocal, narcissistic, academics who are on social media a lot and at meetings a lot and um, they have no there's no disincentive for them to be absolutely vile about me to their students to colleagues to administrators and to whip up student sentiment against me uh, or there wasn't um, and I mean I, I think listening to what you've both said I think um, it the, the real the real thing that we need to sever is the link between activism and careerism in universities, it is 100% in your interest, or it was the last time I was in a university, to be an activist, even in the promotion criteria. And I'm talking about the university I was familiar with, but in the promotion criteria, it would say, are you a good ally? You know, you, you, could, you could get points in your promotional case by showing how moral you were and how um, you thought the right things. And um, so that, that, that obviously that's going to, a, it's going to deter heterodoxy because it's going to end up having professional consequences, not just social consequences. And so much of um, academic progression is based on relying on other people to let you through the gate. You know, if you, you need your stuff in, in prestigious journals, you need to get the right sorts of grants, you need to be on the right sorts of committees. So you can't afford to alienate people in those ways if, you've got, if you're young and you want to get on. And that's important. Um, so that's what people mean when they talk about capture. Then, yeah. That it, somehow that a group had worked out the mechanics of taking over an institution. Sort of instinctive. I don't think they actually <laughs> thought it through very carefully. I think it's just that, um, I mean, there's, there's many other layers to this which make it very complicated. So one is that a lot of academics are in, unable to face confrontation and really just want to get on with their 16th century manuscript or whatever and don't want to be on social media. Most academics aren't on social media and they're like, oh, I can't go on there. But that leaves the field free for some, a few people to be extremely uh, influential. There's also um, a genuine fear of um, upsetting students for number, a number of reasons. One is uh, fees, like since the caps came off, all universities are in competition with each other. Some universities are undoubtedly about to go under financially. Um, I, I'm sure Cambridge and Oxford, different kettle of fish, but in the universities I was familiar with, it, um, people were terrified for years. You know, we couldn't even photocopy <laughs> there was just budgets being cut all the time. And then there's also a massive spectre of student mental health because nobody, including in the government, can work out whether we're in, a loco, in loco parentis, whether we're supposed to be looking after anxious students. There's no, uh, as far as I can see, there's no um, consideration of whether you're fit to study. So you can come with massive mental health problems and just be waved through and then arrive in the classroom saying, I am too anxious to be asked questions. I can't talk about, I, I don't want to hear about this very difficult subject. I want a trigger warning. And if you're desperate for their fees, <laughs> you know, there's no incentive to actually manage that situation very well. And there's more and more and more students with severe mental health problems or, or just diagnosed mental health problems like anxiety and depression, which you might think are normal for students, but you mm. just can't tell anymore. No one can tell. 
So, um, so actually, it, that's it, dissuading heterodoxy and, you know, saying the truth mm. <laughs> quite often. That also muddies, because this is sometimes cast as being a kind of right-wing uh, attack mm -hmm. on the universities. In fact, Harvard and those institutions now, that's very much the line they're taking, which is this is a conservative conspiracy <laughs> campaign against us. But in a way, what you're saying is the opposite, that the, the marketization yeah. of universities, it's which is a, a conservative difference. type of idea, you might think, has, that, has kind of backfired. Well, I completely think that's true. I mean, you just, in my particular area of expertise, which is sex and gender and the way that um, HR was just taken over by kite mark schemes and award ceremonies and every university saying, we want to get into the top 100 Stonewall. I mean, basically, as other people have said, getting Stonewall to mark your homework handing out your policies to Stonewall, and Stonewall come back and said, no, no, you've mentioned the word woman here, you, your changing rooms aren't inclusive, you know, you, have you considered your, your teaching material? And in my university, it said in the policy that trans people had to be represented in a positive light or something, that was built into one of our policies. So no other group was treated like that, and no one seemed to question it, because the thing is, it appeals, or well, they think it appeals to students. They think... We want to be ideal. We want to appeal to idealistic young queer people, particularly in Brighton. So let's just go with it, and everybody else is going with it anyway. So who who would we be to? So it's partly the students, the tail not, wagging the dog. It's not even again. It's not that students are demanding this, um, and a few are. And again, the very same dynamic of a few people being very vocal. <laughs> uh, universities not having the mechanisms to do proper polling of what students think. So they have, in my view. Um, ridiculous kind of student reps, which again produces a careerist activist type of student who comes into the meeting with uh, with the, the lecturers and says, "We want this, we want that, we want trigger warnings." We, you know, this person's transphobic, and so on. And the and and the administrators and the teachers just go, "Oh, okay," right. and change all their policies. <laughs> One thing we haven't talked about that much, I really want to come on to what might be done about all of these interlocking issues, but it feels like we have to spend a moment on the, the recent controversy around Palestinian, pro-Palestinian protests, what should be allowed, what shouldn't be allowed. That's really what started this whole recent wave and ultimately led to the resignation of Claudine Gay and, and the others. Does anyone here share my slight concern that by sort of weaponizing the same tactics that the left have been using to silence opinions they find unsavory on this question of Israel, sort of the, the political right has now lost the argument as well, and it sort of yeah. establishes a new principle that nasty things shouldn't be said on universities. What's your view, Pete? Do you, do you think, how, has that been a step forward or a step back, that whole free speech uh, So just to, to rewind that tape a bit, that's not why Claudine Gay resigned. Cla right. Claudine Gay resigned because unquestionably she is a plagiarist. She mm. took ideas that were not hers and she accredited, made them as if they were hers. And it's worth noting, she also plagiarized her acknowledgments, <laughs> which is utterly <laughs> astonishing. Okay, now, now back to the issue. So, But the energy was kicked off by that hearing. That's correct. And that's correct. why there was such focus on the plagiarism issue. So it was sort of mm. secondary effect. That's correct. And so... The problem is that universities, and, and again, I can't speak to this c context, uh, but it does seem to be in the Anglosphere led by the United States. The problem is that if they never said anything, if they never involved themselves in politics, if, if they didn't have any um, diversity, equity, and inclusion statements, there would be no problem with, it, with those responses. But the problem is that they selectively pick, they decided what they wanted to, to choose, <clears throat> and then they were vocal about it. And the, the principle in which they invoked was a, an oppressor oppressed. And so they view, largely, they view Jews as whites, they view Israel as a colonial power, as a manifestation of the, of colonial values by white people against dark people or brown people. Also within this this worldview, they view Muslims as oppressed, and so there's a whole worldview that goes into understanding why they said what they said. So if you understand and you've read the literature, then it makes perfect sense for why they would say that. 
but it's been it's just been this huge backlash, hasn't it? And you've got this guy called Christopher Rufo yeah. in the US who's been extraordinarily successful directly campaigning against these figures and he overtly says he's using the playbook that he's learned off the left and I'm just I'm wondering here you know is there a danger that all these institutions any sense of neutrality is just mm. lost and it becomes whichever political campaign is more effective mm -hmm. captures them mm. I mean I share your worry Freddie and you know the irony here is if you're know, looking back at those hearings I mean their responses you know are these is it appropriate to be calling for XYZ and saying well it depends on the context was basically right because yes, it will depend on the context. Mm. If you know, it's 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 one thing uh, going on a pro-Palestine march on October the sixth. It's very different going on a pro-Palestine march on October the eighth outside the Israeli embassy, firing fireworks at it and praying and celebrating and, ju and being a kind of state of jubilation. I mean, those and calling and calling for from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. So it does depend on the context. And, but, you know, f freedom, within, freedom of speech within law is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a well-accepted paradigm. And what's legal and what's illegal speech has is, is also been pretty clear. But should you be allowed so, to say from the river to the sea in Cambridge? On October the 8th, uh, you know, when the blood of the victims has, has barely run cold, I'd say there's a, there's a much stronger case for censoring that kind of, that kind of behavior if it's, in, you know, and if, if it's clearly intimidating Jewish students, there's a stronger case for it than if that kind of behaviour is happening on, on October the sixth. Now, today, now I, I'd be very, cons yeah, I'd be very. I mean, I absolutely, you know, students should be able to speak freely on the issue now. I mean, I, 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 yeah, and I, I, don't, I think one's got to be very, very, very careful not to be, uh, not to be heavy-handed in the other direction. Yeah. So, so I share your concerns, and I don't, I think, you know, their, their actual responses in that hearing. You know, they were smugly delivered, but, yeah. but basically correct. Kathleen? I agree with James, and I've written as much in a couple of places. Um, I mean, the principle of academic freedom is just, it's, it can't just be invoked every time <laughs> you agree with the sentiments being suppressed. Um, it's, you're setting a precedent if you just dive in. And I was absolutely a bit, sh I was quite shocked by um, some people that would call themselves allies, allies of mine and have gone on and on and on about freedom of speech, apparently forgetting everything they just said um, on even October the 8th, actually. Uh, context is everything. Um, it isn't the same. I mean, I don't, I don't have a dog in the fight, but it is not the same thing to say um, uh, Palestine should be free is not the same thing as calling for genocide. You know, there's about 10 moves potentially there that you would have to discuss and mm. you would have You can't just shut that down and say this means that and you can't say that and the reason I think that is because I'm very very familiar with people taking my speech when I say trans women are men for instance <laughs> and inferring all sorts of mm. uh, terrible uh, immoral context uh, content from it uh, without any Consultation of the context and what I meant by it and why I said it and so on, and it you know so it almost felt reminiscent of when you were yeah I, well I can see out. the move I can see and, and and it's quite strange watching people who are very very clear to support me when I say I'm a gender critical person suddenly saying ah but when they say this they really mean this like, well I I've got I've written a whole book about meaning and intention and I think intention has got something to do with it and you can't foreclose intention just by looking at very gross behavioural aspects of speech. So, so, so yeah. you, you remain a free speech reader now. I'm afraid I do, yeah. Um, I want to I think about if there is... The, the question we put on the poster is, are the universities doomed? Is university <laughs> doomed as an institution? And I have a feeling, Pete, that you think the answer might be yes. So give us the case for burn them all down, the institution is beyond saving. Too bad we don't have two hours for that question. So I do believe that they should be all burned down, and here's why. <laughs> so, so first of all, I just, I just want a quick show of hands. Just, I'm just curious. The number of, uh, the percentage of, of people who hold PhDs who have plagiarized their dissertations, who thinks it's under 5% raise their hand? One. One in the whole room. Wow. Who thinks it's under 20%? Okay, that's the mode. Most people. Okay, so, so I mentioned before at the start it's worth talking about. So you have people who have cheated. You have the institutions who have protected people who have cheated. You've had 
institutions and administrators who have been hoodwinked by monstrously idiotic ideas. There's literally nothing interesting about these ideas. And they're put forward by profoundly mediocre minds. Okay. The larger problem in the corruption of academic literature, let's see if I can do this in a minute. <clears throat> in order to get promoted, you need to publish. In order to publish, this goes back to Freddie, your comment about institutional capture. What does it mean to be captured? In order to publish something, you have to, peer-reviewed publishing, it's not the same as publishing as unheard, unheard of the Telegraph or what have you. It's a, an article that your peers who are experts in the field view as worthy to be added to the canon of literature. So as a general rule, seven papers in seven years, in general, will get one tenure. Okay. You cannot publish a paper, particularly in the humanities, that runs contra to the narrative. So there's very specific power relations, gender relations, very specific dynamics. Kathleen is very familiar with those in her, in her discipline. Okay. So you have entire bodies of academic literature that have been corrupted. You cannot publish something that goes against the narrative. You cannot publish, for example, something that says, uh, uh, you know, the number of unarmed black men shot by police is, is, is proportionate to the number of... Uh, Roland Fryer tried something similar to that at Harvard. And by the way, he was the victim of Claudine Gay's witch hunt. Okay, so you have bodies of literature that have been corrupted. 50%, think about, really think about this. 50% of papers in psychology, it's called a replication crisis, cannot be replicated. 50%? Are you, are you kidding me? You mean half of half of the stuff, the, of the work that, that people go into a clinical setting with, the tools that they go to help people, you mean half of those can't be replicated? Let that percolate. That's astonishing. And we're teaching those, and I go all around the world, and I say, who's familiar with the replication crisis? Who's a psychology major? Who's familiar with the replication crisis? Nobody has any idea what it is. Nobody. Nobody. I probably asked that question 500 times at universities. Clueless. Y you can mitigate that very quickly by putting it in the syllabus to be in class. Look, we don't know if this is true. It's our best guess. 50% chance. You're flipping the dice. Okay. So why are the institutions doomed? You have... A situation in which my, my personal feeling is that there are around, I could be wrong about this, we'll know soon enough, about 10% of academicians have plagiarized in, in the humanities, probably lower in the sciences. In the sciences, you probably see data fraud as more of a phenomenon. Okay. You, the, the reason that there's a legitimation crisis, that's Habermas's 1973 phrase from a paper, the German philosopher, the reason that there's a crisis in the legitimacy of institutions is because those institutions are not worthy of our trust. They have betrayed public trust. They have become, our engines of knowledge production are fundamentally compromised. And when they're fundamentally compromised, it's like, was it the horse in Alice in Wonderland that runs off furiously in all directions, right? So... But if the, what are you gonna, I mean, we're obviously by saying burn them all down, we don't, we're not actually talking about physically burning them down. <laughs> what is it that you suggest we do? In that situation. Well, there's only one thing. Look, look. It is better for people. I, well, one thing we can do is we, we can start plugging vocational schools, right? But it is better to, for people. Dan Denon picks up a, a famous phrase: "If it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. If it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. It is not worth learning a process that takes you away from reality. You would be far better if you literally looked at a wall." <laughs> you, you would be. Then if you learned something that took you, that divorced you from reality and inhibited your function in social civil society. So you have no hope that this can, problem can be corrected, that these institutions can stop becoming well, it, more it, worthwhile again? It's, it's, it's no. So not only do I have no hope, but if you want any kind of hope, you have to burn them down. So what is the alternative to that? The alternative is, and Kathleen is also a founding faculty fellow at the University of Austin and other places. Yeah, but I don't agree with you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you my solution. My solution is, rather than look, we have institutions, academic institutions that are ideology mills. 
their primary function, and their primary function of people who mm. teach there, is to discharge some deranged ideological mission. So, so start new ones. So the, okay, so start start new ones, but it's insufficient to start new ones. New ones in a capitalist framework can put pressure to to leverage themselves for other institutions to have some kind of a corrective mechanism. But right now, there's no corrective mechanism. So you have to start new institutions. Stephen Blackwood was here when we last did our event. He started Ralston College. More institutions are popping up. But right now, what we have is a situation that is, that is literally teaching people that the foundations of Western civil society are cancerous and poisonous, and that thinking has metastasized throughout the system. James, you'd probably agree with the, the last bit there to do with uh, forgetting the, uh, the, the canon of Western civilization. I'm guessing you don't want to burn Cambridge down, given that they're Absolutely young. not, and yet the <laughs> canon is under fire. But I just, I mean, it's worth pointing out that, you know, I, I agree with Pete, you know, the replication crisis, which goes back, what, 2005, when that guy first published his paper that said, what, more than half of studies in social sciences were not, not replicable. Um, I mean, that's a serious crisis for the social sciences. Now, that is different from a lot of the other, you know, lots, of, lots more to the humanities than just the social sciences who are kind of both pretending to be scientists and pretending to be kind of in the humanities. <laughs> so, um, but so I, it's, it's not, I don't think it is as bad in, say, English and in history and in law uh, and in philosophy. But the, 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 the dynamics are, are still, the ideological um, uh, sort of constrictions are, are, are in place. But the replication crisis is not primarily an ideologically driven. It's a, it's a sort of... It's the incentive structures that are... And yeah, the it's a function of university architecture. Makes it a but, but plot for us how we get from here to a good well, place. Well, so, I mean, I think we are already in a good place in the sense that I think there are extramural bits of infrastructure that can pretty well replicate what we want the social sciences to do for the public square. I mean, you know, here in London, I think it's the same in Washington. It's really, you know, think tanks. So a lot of the really sort of politically policy sort of salient projects in the social sciences that have got real sort of cut through can be replicated by think tanks for public policy and uh, private companies for STEM. Um, so, and that's, that's already happening, I think, um, you know, to some degree. So in, in a, and now, all parallel universities are starting new institutions. I mean, you know, all, all strength to you guys, what you're doing at the University of Austin and, and Ralston and so on. And, and you, you see this sort of pressure occurring in the, you know, the early 19th century when Oxford and Cambridge had a total stranglehold I, I just and other want, universities started to sort of set up. just want to push you a little bit. I know you have to, you know, you are representing Cambridge at this discussion and I don't expect you to be um, disproportionately critical of them, but yeah. do you think there are issues, serious issues, in, even in universities like Cambridge, or do you think we're fine? I think we're in a much better place than, say, Harvard or the Big Ivies. I mean, Harvard has got, is, is really a hedge fund with the university attached. It's got $50 billion uh, under assets. You know, Cambridge's endowment, I think, is about $8 billion. And with that, we still managed to get to pretty much, I think we were, you know, last year, top of one of the, one of the two big university rankings. But, and, and, but we're much more responsive to public criticism. And being poorer, more exposed to legal liability. And will be very interesting to see when the new... Freedom of Speech Higher Education Act starts really kicking in in August, um, what effect that's going to have on the intellectual climate within the universities. I mean, I'm you know, quietly hopeful that it will have a meaningful impact. Um, uh, now, Do you see what you're doing, which is to be a bit more vocal about your ideas, yeah. even if they don't go along the current of prevailing opinion? Do you think that's part of the remedy here? I think so. More people need to speak out and, and more people need to be confident in not just talking about free speech but actually exercising their rights to free speech. Uh, and certainly those who've made it into the institutions uh, I think have a special moral obligation to uh, you know, test received wisdom and, and to be heterodox, not just for the sake of it but where they've got heterodox views and, and, and to speak out confidently because you know, if you're a graduate student or you're in that sort of awful twilight zone uh, of the you know the postdoc between kind of very kind of precarious existence as, a, as an academic looking for a job and somebody's won the won the lottery ticket and got into the institution you you know it's it's there's clearly pressure to conform um, there's clearly a lot of gatekeeping at okay. applications and and jo so with, speaking with, with out job appointment is panels part, is part of the the prescription Kath I, I want to ask you if we've had a conversation here 
before, and it struck me then that you were extraordinarily generous about the institution that, frankly, treated you appallingly. Um, both <laughs> Don't among... think they'd say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, you're. How, how can you? Is it right that you feel still defensive in a way of universities, even the one that you left? <laughs> Mm, no, not really. <laughs> but okay. I do feel defensive of philosophy. And um, I don't think I agree with you, Peter, that there's sort of bad ideas that we need to root out directly because they're just obviously false and, um, you know, you'd be better off looking at a wall than these ideas because I think you get rid of enormous parts of the history of philosophy if you start going down that route. I think philosophy is, I mean, the question is, what is reality? And in a way, that is what even gender studies academics are trying to answer. Mm -hmm. It's still a philosophical impulse. It's, um, yes, they're not doing it very well. Yes, they're accepting certain things as axiomatic that they should be questioning and all that. But they are still trying to engage in, in important metaphysical thoughts that I think we shouldn't just dismiss as um, ridiculous, you know, in a sort of brute empiricist kind of way. So what I think we need to do is work, act more indirectly to try and get the quality of thought. I mean, if we're assuming that universities are for producing research, because we could actually decide that they're not. Most research produced in the humanities doesn't get read by anybody. You know, not <laughs> really, literally, True. like two, two people read the average. Zero to one remember. citations yeah. for the average. So you, and it's a, it's a preposterous system. It really is. You know, you work for three years, you get multiple edits, you get multiple rejections, <coughs> eventually it gets published and no one reads it. Um, so we could have a conversation about that, but assuming you are trying to produce quality researchers in the humanities, and obviously you want to improve the quality, so you need to sever the link between activism and careerism, you need to develop internal norms somehow which say, no, you can't just go on the internet and uh, produce an ad hominem character assassination of the person that you disagree with intellectually. You have to stick to the arguments. Maybe just ban them from social media. I don't know. But something has to be done to kind of get this kind of knee-jerk moralizing and preening and narcissistic posturing that goes on. That's really partly the problem. You can get a lot of social capital very quickly in universities through very shallow intellectual moves. Mm. So I don't know how exactly we get those norms back. Um, but I don't think it's by saying this whole body of thought is illegitimate. The problem isn't necessarily directly that those ideas are there, it's that no other ideas are allowed in. Um, that you have to kind of, as you've said, work within these incredibly narrow parameters as the rules of the game as a starting point or you won't get anywhere. And that is anti-intellectual. And final word before we go to our small break, a word about the students, because it feels like we haven't mm. spoken that much about yeah. them. You're, you've written for us about how you think the kids are all right. Yeah, I do. Uh, I really do. How so? Well, because they're the same as they always have been. Uh, they're the same as they were when you were younger. Um, they're naive and idealistic and curious, and, and many of them are clever. I mean, it's possibly true that too many of them are doing, you know, they're not in the right subjects for, because there was a massive expansion of the universities and uh, people ended up doing things that perhaps they weren't best suited to, but they're still trying and they're still really... Um, argumentative um, it's again it's this small number of people are allowed to chill the general environment it's the same dynamic outside universities in every institution there is pretty much mm. and it's no different for them so we have to free them somehow <laughs> we have to uh, allow them to speak their mind because I do think that they are frightened now very frightened of saying what they think and that's a terrible position to be in as a young person Project Free the Students and Save the Universities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have 30 minutes to do this. Um, so we're going to take a very short 10 to 15 minute break. Do get a drink if you want one, um, or do whatever you need to do. Downstairs is open as well as here. Um, if you're watching online, get your questions ready, and Flo will ask them. So see you in exactly 50 minutes for the group discussion. Thank you. Yeah, I know. Why do I disagree? Yes. Yeah, what would you like?
Um, okay, so this is the part of the evening where we open it out uh, and people in the room can get involved. Please do try to think of things in question formulation. I know it can be tempting when Julian, who is just standing over there, comes around with his physical microphone. Sometimes we have to physically wrench it off people <laughs> when they get in their stride, but we're going to be quite disciplined on that. So he wants to end in a question mark. Uh, and then we also have Flo, who is in touch with the online audience, who will be throwing in some questions as well. So, well, Julian, if, raise your hands if you have something to, to ask. Okay. Julian can go and find you. But in Best the meantime, let's just kick off with a, a question from the online audience. Yeah, so we've got a question here from an online listener called Jake Forder. And they ask, you see I'm quite good at that, they ask that um, how much of the rot that we've been talking about today, this is, I suppose, an, a UK-based question, can be blamed on Tony Blair introducing student loans <laughs> and aiming for 50% of the UK to get degrees? Kath, is it all Tony Blair's fault? Uh, um, <laughs> it's partly Tony Blair's fault uh, because undoubtedly um, the introduction of student fees changed everything. Um, it was already, it was incrementally happening anyway through um, grants, but um, that did, and then also deciding that everyone had to go to university, that all the polytechnics could have to become universities, that somehow in this kind of beautiful meritocracy, <laughs> everyone was going to come out with um, a degree in the humanities, I mean, and not really thinking about the consequences of that, uh, which have been severe. So all sorts of consequences, unforeseen consequences, like grade inflation, for, for instance, um, which is definitely happening in some institutions. Basically too many people going. Too many so people elite... paying for it, being in debt for it, expecting, suddenly acting like customers, their parents acting like customers, more to the point. So suddenly open days, parents are there saying, well, what are the facilities like and how many hours a week are you going to be seeing mm. our students and, you know, and complaining much more uh, and, and also just becoming more, much more psychologically difficult for lecturers to, to say, no, you've failed <laughs> when, they, when you know how much money they've spent to do it. And and the 50% you know, thing is also very hard to argue against, isn't it? It's another one of these questions where you, you seem like a villain if you disagree with the idea that one in two people should go to university, you're an elitist, or you want to keep it as a preserve. Yeah. Of a small, should university be an elite project? Well, I'm against elites generally, um, and, but I think in a university, <laughs> um, intelligence is the currency. And... So it seems reasonable to expect a certain degree of intelligence, and that is what you are. Uh, <laughs> you're making, you know, you're 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 telling the world that this person has passed a certain level of um, proficiency in uh, abstract reasoning or whatever. So That's I mean, I, I don't, I'm not saying it means anything morally. I'm not saying it makes you a better person. I'm not saying it makes you more employable, and often it makes you less employable to be quite clever. But, um, but I'm just saying that if that's what universities are for, then it makes no sense to expand it to everybody and then mm. give them all first. OK, so we're partly blaming Tony Blair there. Let's get a question from... <laughs> yes. So my question does follow on a bit. I, I'm a computer scientist, so humanities, I have no idea. But it does seem to me that there's an enormous <coughs> amount of work being done all the time. It gets harder and harder to be original. So what percentage of the population should do a humanities uh, qualification, a degree, a master's, a PhD. Mm. Mm. James, got a number? Yeah, well, um, the, How many the, are you well, probably, pro probably fewer than 50%. And I mean, we've blamed Tony Blair, but we've got, we can't. We can't leave out John Major. I mean, it was the, it was the Conservatives in the early 90s who abolished that distinction between, you know, universities as a sort of really, you know, a knowledge hub, a theoretical knowledge hub, and the vocational institutions, the polytechnics, that, you know, dealt with, with service to the, the, the other sort of essential kind of function of higher education. Um, so, I mean, you, you know... You, the, the signal of a humanities degree is, as Kathleen said, it's, it's cognitive ability, but it's also conscientiousness. If you know, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's effectively a kind of IQ test getting into a, a strong university, and then it's a conscientiousness test if you can make it all the way through the degree, and that performs, you know, a valuable role. It signals to the professions that this is a person who's going to, you know, is going is to work well in your organisation. But, you know. Touch on this already. There's serious grade inflation. You know, in 20 in degree inflation in 2010, 
I think it was about 15% of degrees were firsts. It's now, well, just during the pandemic, it was to almost 40%. It's gone back down a little bit. But so, the, you know, the kind of the credentialing signal is definitely more confounded. And you're also getting an increasingly politicised admissions process. Right. So this is where a lot of universities see themselves as a kind of, you know, as, as an agent of social engineering. And so you're seeing, for example, this is happening in the Russell Group universities in particular, but quite aggressive affirmative action against in the independent sector, for example, or certainly clear, you know, clear double standards. Now, there's a, you know, good arguments to be made on both sides whether they should, whether the universities should be doing that. But again, that, that makes it harder for the professions, as it were, outside to assess the value of a humanities degree. It's just it's much, much more stable. So we should be meaner about marking and have fewer people go through the process. Yeah. Um, we've got a related or, question, actually, okay. just from an anonymous reader online who asks, should employers be allowed to do IQ tests if we no longer can trust <laughs> the outcome of degrees? Well, the, they, they do. I mean, I've, this is anecdotal, but I gather that, you know, among the top law firms, the, you know, when I've, I've in a former life, I was, I was a lawyer and I remember applying and you basically sent in a CV and a, and a covering letter and then you maybe did one, you know, basic test when you turned up. Now I gather the, you know, the top law firms require you to go through pages and pages of, of tests and mm. sort of assessments and so on. And so they're having to make up for the deficit that, mm. you know, the dysfunctioning credentialing, um, yeah, the dysfunctional I, credentialing. Let's, I just want to say, just before we move to the next, that IQ tests are test of pretty much nothing and nothing important in life. So I certainly don't. I want to just put that in on record. <laughs> on record. Question over here. Thanks. Um, the panel probably knows that uh, Joe Phoenix won her industrial tribunal against the Open University today. Do you see that as an encouraging sign? So this is, well, Kath, do you want to tell us about what this case is? We covered it in uh, our ad today. Yes. Um, so Professor Joe Phoenix, a uh, gender-critical criminologist at the Open University, or was at the Open University, um, won her employment tribunal today, uh, effectively um, the, a very conclusive judgment said she was harassed. Um, she, I think she was constructively dismissed. Yes, yes. yes yeah. thank God. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, and and it, and you should, if you get a chance to read the the report, it's quite amusing. Although it's 156 pages long, but there are some bits that are quite telling. For instance, the judge's um, deprecation of the evidence offered by um, the other side, uh, their inability to produce rigorous thought, <laughs> things like that. So that's all very pleasing. So, but do you, uh, do you when you've been persecuted that, by these people for a long, that's a long a sort time. Of anomalous example where maybe there was a favourable judge who sort of simply oh. agreed, or do you think? Do you think it's we should interpret that as a sign of progress? That I'll just say progress, but I've no idea, obviously. But I mean, it's but, good. It sets a precedent. It's more evidence that um, you can't get away with this stuff. Gender critical beliefs, for instance, are legally protected now. Um, there was an academic freedom element in the judgment. Um, and it's, it's shaming for the Open University, and it's shaming for the people that participated in the persecution of this very outstanding academic. So I think shame here would be a very, you know, is a tool that we should lean on because it should just be embarrassing to have signed one of these letters saying this person should be, you know, their, their research network should be destroyed. That, I'm not saying sack them, I'm saying make them embarrassed. So that is optimistic then, at least it's, it is positive that if, if this is the latest in quite a big series of examples, maybe these institutions will be more careful before conducting these kind of campaigns? Well, they should be, because otherwise it's going to be quite expensive. Advice there. Uh, let's, let's go maybe on this side. One here. Yeah, well, let's have one here, and then we'll go over there. We want to be... Hi there. You talked about Christopher Rufo earlier and about activism. You just talked about the Free Speech Union as well. Um, his activism, I think, is necessary. It's unfortunate, but I think it's necessary. Um, he took over or helped take over a Florida public university. He... he um, under Ron DeSantis, took the board over. He, he was also responsible for putting an audit of some of the books and some of the schools in, in Florida as well. These are unfortunate things to have to do, but I think they're necessary. Um, Free Speech Union, again, uh, have been doing audits of libraries in the UK. And for example, example, Kathleen's book has been sort of put around the back in some of these libraries. So I actually do think that there has to be a case for being active. Um, it's all very well saying free speech is free speech that, and you guys are incredibly brave. 
But I think it has to go another step further. This is really gets the Christopher Rufo, who the gentleman is mentioning, is a kind of politically on the right activist in the US, and he's been incredibly successful at attacking institutions that he think have been captured by leftists, is what he, how he would put it, using many of their same tools and, and public shaming and, and campaigning techniques. Um, Pete, are you a Christopher Rufo fan? Do you think it's a case of if you can't, if you can't sustain the kind of liberal ideal of neutral institutions and the other side is, is thinking in a particular way, both sides of the political aisle should engage in this kind of Fight. No, well, full disclosure, Christopher is a friend of mine. I, I have some disagreements, and I guess this piggybacks off of Kathleen's question. There are entire bodies of literature that are fraudulent. To, phrenology is fraudulent. If they taught Nazi race science, that's fraudulent. We wouldn't want that taught. So the question is, in what co should we teach these things in which context? In the, the school in Florida is New College. And he's re replaced people who are, to say they're livid would be putting it quite mildly. So the, qu the question is, w what sort of, what do we teach at public institutions? And what role ought the state to have, well actually this is in the United States context obviously, but what role ought the state have to influence that curricula? It, and it all gets back, I think the whole conversation can, this is an emerging theme that's come up, can be centered on Kathleen's question, James' question, your question, what's the purpose of the institution? So, so Claudine Gay, getting back to your original statement, she only had 11 publications. And that's, that's an embarrassment. And, and, and I've read, not all of them, I've, I've read many of them. Um, um, I'm trying to say something that's not overly, she wasn't up to overly being disparaging. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that, it's, it's really, it's really a, a public disgrace. And so the question is... But should you ban books? I mean, that's what it comes down to, that kind of thinking, that the Christopher Rufo, Ron well, DeSantis, is almost at saying there'd be different books than their political opponents yeah. would ban, but they're saying you can't have this book. Well, that's the... So actually, my question to you is, if a college here were teaching Nazi race science, do you think that should be banned? So, in other words, is there a threshold of what we ban? And if the answer to that question is yes, then you have to calibrate and figure out what that threshold is. That's strangely parallel to the move that trans activists move on me all the time. Yeah. You know, why? I mean, I think you can say, you can, choose, you can always find an extreme example like phrenology um, and say, uh, obviously, that should never be taught. Obviously, there's no empirical uh, evidence for that. But, but phrenology isn't being taught, and Nazi race science isn't being taught, but even by your enemies. critical race theory is being yes, taught. Yes, but that's, so why don't we just stick to the examples we have rather than constantly moving to this extreme example going, would you ban that? Because that's, it, it, there's no, no motivation to teach those things right now. Uh, so in other words, like, why should we ban critical race theory? Well, because it offers a... Well, OK, first of all, I'm not, I don't think critical race theory should be banned in practice. I think what should be banned are the institutional mechanisms that have been weaponized against heretics and dissenters, against blasphemers, and those are DEI boards. And so you cannot have a, you cannot have a diversity, equity, and inclusion board and have any kind of free speech at all. Mm. It, it's just th those two things are fundamentally incompatible. And from that, then you can have a conversation about what the curricula should be. Mm. So should critical race theory be banned? I don't know. It's a, it's a tricky question. Certainly not at a private school. At a public school with taxpayer money, that becomes significantly more complicated. Mm. DEI was mentioned there. We haven't actually spoken about it very much. Mm. Where, where do you stand on this? Do you, are you, do you one of the people who thinks we should root out the whole principle of DEI because it's anti-meritocratic and it leads to this kind of corruption? Or are you more tolerant than that? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think the correct number of DEI commissars in higher education in the UK is zero. Right. Um, but I would, I'm, I'm certainly with Kathleen in sharing kind of misgivings about banning any, anything, uh, at least at tertiary education. I mean, the school, the part of the, what's going on in Florida is uh, primary and secondary school literature and curricula and that, that, that sort of thing. But yeah, policing curricular content and, and, and refracting it through some kind of ideological prism, a conservative ideological prism, is definitely not, not the solution here. Um, there should be basic freedom 
for all universities to... Affect. I mean, that's what academic freedom is. And I know there was some debate when this, this UK legislation was going through as to whether or not the government should try to, you know, signal something in the, um, in the provisions that said, you know, there shouldn't be plainly politicised uh, 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 curricula, something like what we have in the 96 Education Act, where, you know, teachers are, are, are not supposed to present politically partisan positions without, without doing, it, doing it in a balanced way. But the government held off, I think, probably, I think rightly, from doing that. Um, but it's, it's true that, you know, the, the grievance industrial complex is not as serious as it is over in the States, but there are definitely elements of it there. I mean, you know, Oxford employs 40, 40 full-time employees on EDI issues. That's 2 million quid a year in salaries. I mean, think what that could do in terms of, you know, PhD scholarships and postdocs and so on. And what do they do? I mean, they're, they're basically make work positions. They're just trying to create and, and enlarge, enlarge the bureaucracy. Yeah, they're, just as an aside uh, to build on that, those are offices in search of tasks. Right. Let's get another question from the audience. Uh, thank you so much. Um, all three of you have talked about an angry vocal minority who are directing opinion and while I'm usually happy to blame Tony Blair for everything, I wonder if we could blame the silent majority who are frightened of speaking out. And so I wondered if you could give very practical advice for all of us who are too timid to speak within our social groups or within our corporate groups or within our academic groups. How do we get our voices to be politely heard? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> We've got an extension on that question, I Big think, going. from our audience, which is from Brad Sipes, who asks, how do we convince the typical student that they should expect and, in fact, desire to be challenged at university? Hmm. So the two sides of the coin, hmm. how do we make it comfortable for people to speak out and make people expect to be Kathleen, challenged? Kathleen, you spoke out and you're, you're, you're thriving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at me. <laughs> um, I think students... <coughs> But there's no point putting all the onus on students. We've got to lead by example for a start. Actually, they want to speak out. We just need to make it so that they can feel like they're not about to be reported. But in terms of the sort of silent majority in institutions, well, the law is now there to... I mean, the law is there to protect you in gender critical thought, for example. Um, and there's strength... There's also satellite institutions have emerged, like the Free Speech Union, Academics for Academic Freedom, various others that I can't remember the name of, but there's quite a lot of um, self-organisation going on amongst academics at the moment who are really worried or, or want, to, want to kind of correct things and to, to um, support iconoclastic or heterodox thinking. Um, so strength in numbers is always good. If you can find people that think the same as you and present a united front, that is good. Um, but at a certain point, I think you just have to work out, <laughs> without wanting to be um, glib, you know, what your life is for. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> what do you want to do? When you die, do you want to look back and think, I kept my head down all that time, bit my tongue till it was bleeding, got furious every night at these people and their power over me? Or do you want to just say, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you? <laughs> Politely. <laughs> Politely. Question over here, yes. Yeah. To what extent are government and business involved in this mess? Because it seems in their own institutions, the government's captured willingly or unwillingly by work, and also big business in terms of its ESG scores. Mm. There seems to be a pipeline of this ideological efference running through everything. <laughs> so what the, what's the what's your view on that? And just for the record, I'm self-identified as fabulous gender and my pronouns are darling and sweet tip. <laughs> uh, thanks for that. Um, I, that it does I, I agree with the tenor of your question actually, which is that it's not just the universities. No. Mm. Corporations have gone the same way. It's this sense that neutral is no longer virtuous. Mm. Mm. Uh, and every, any institution needs to have an activist position on everything, otherwise mm. it's somehow failing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, this didn't come from universities, weirdly enough. That's, it just show, under, underlines the, the weakness of university institutions, that they were just copying everybody else. Mm. So, you, don't yeah. think it's, you don't think what's happening in the corporate sector is downstream of... Well, it's a sort of probably yeah. like, um, I don't know, symbiosis, mm. or whatever the word is. But, um, 
I think the, it's corporate woke washing has affected universities. They've got on board with mm. Goldman Sachs and uh, the police and you know all the other organisations that are going for this. So yes, and and the civil service is is obviously mm. um, subject to the same influences. Uh, it's everywhere. But I and mean, the media, it, I should say, and you know, well, up corporates until... will threaten to pull their advertising exactly if you don't uh, tick the white boxes. And, and the BBC the has obviously got problems uh, with what it can say and what it can't say, what it can report on and what it can't report on. So yes, it's a it's a big phenomenon. But the solutions aren't that complicated it is just the majority saying we've had enough <laughs> let's get another question Ju julian there's a guy with this hand over there okay thank you um peter in particular you talked about the difficulty of getting articles accepted in referee journals unless they conform to a uh, a sort of preordained ideological viewpoint i'm sure you're right although it's a mere suspicion I've got two questions about it. How do you prove it to those who say, no, we're just exercising academic discretion. Uh, we don't want to hire creationists in biology departments. We don't want to accept articles by uh, race scientists. So we're just exercising the same discretion. And secondly, what do you do about it? Do you set up rival journals or rival universities, or do you try to reintegrate heterodox views in the same, uh, the same system? Well, how do, you, how do you prove it? You just have to look at the journals. I mean, for example, um Hypatia, it's the feminist journal. Do they ever publish something that runs against the main, the main tendons? I mean, uh, I haven't read Hypatia in a few years. Or the Journal of Fat Studies, for example. Do they... Fat Studies doesn't do what you think it does, by the way. It doesn't look at A1Cs and how many carbs and what ratio to protein one should eat to, to, to live a kind of reasonable, healthy lifestyle. It, it is a fat activism journal. And so it even looks at the idea that obesity, for example, is a medicalized narrative. And it, it forwards certain ideas uh, for fat acceptance. So show me one piece that can get in there that questions the dominant idea of the journal. It, it, th that's, not what it, that's literally not what it does. And when you look in the mission statement, you see that that, that is also not what it does. Actually, Charlene Cooper, the woman who heads the journal, is here in... in London and her, her work is it, it's just monstrous to, to marvel how deranged it is <clears throat> um, again forwarding these narratives that are clearly antithetical to any any sane view of what is healthy what you do is you construct alternative journals mm. there's no other alternative when the journals have been captured the other thing is you have to change the the design of promotion and tenure so you, you have to change the idea that you get so many uh, papers and so many journals before you get tenured. Mm. Like we have to completely, th that yeah, notion. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I basically agree with Pete. I mean, but it is a bit easy to just to, to kind of dis, to, you know, target some of these Mickey Mouse journals. I mean, it, there, the problem does extend to, to a lesser extent to the you know, tier one journals. I mean, in thinking this is certainly true in philosophy on issues that, that, that Kathleen's written so well about. But you've got... I mean, it, it, it's, it's a serious problem. The barriers to entry for setting up a new journal, I mean, so much of these journals Agreed. depend upon <clears throat> prestige Agreed. and a kind of settled view. And it's the same problem, actually, institutionally. It's, you know, setting up a parallel institution that is going to have a comparable credentialing. No, power I agree. It's very, very difficult. And so, now, there have been some developments. So I'm thinking of the Journal of Controversial Studies that was uh, set Peter up. Peter Singer in Australia. With, with yeah. Singer and, and Jeff McMahon and others. And that's, I mean, that's... One way of doing it, but the trouble is, you know, the the, the people, the scholars who are being published there are basically being published pseudonymously or anonymously because they know that if they were, you know, if they were, if their name was up in lights, they'd just mm. put a big a big sort of scarlet letter on their back and make them unpublishable and unemployable. Mm. This is a very difficult nut to crack. Yeah, well, I want to a... say one thing very quickly about that. That's interesting is that in philosophy in particular, you have a lot of really smart people who are good at rationalizing. They're good at offering good reasons for bad conclusions. So what happens is they gatekeep the orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. So the, the, there's a kind of infrastructure that certain conclusions are propped up by really smart people making good arguments. But, and they're valid, but they're not sound. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're untethered to reality. Mm -hmm. And that if you true. do that long enough, 
the indoctrination mechanism becomes complete. We've got a bit more of an existential question from Mana Afsari, who asks, recent critics like Ayan Hasi Ali, writer for Unheard, would argue that our chaotic approach to multiculturalism has undermined the Anglosphere's liberal heritage, and thus the kind of heritage of the liberal university. How can universities transmit liberal values if they cannot agree on those values? Mm. Oh. Anyone want to take that uh, hot <laughs> potato? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we have, a, have other people in the audience have experience, <laughs> recent experience of this, but I mean, I, I think the the problem is actually re the reverse. I think there is a broad consensus uh, within the universities as to what what values are. It's just that they are very contentious values, and uh, they're certainly very different from mm. the kind of founding vision of most right. of these institutions. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the multi, in a way, multiculturalism is a driver of homogeneity because there's a kind of institutional panic that having a, you know, a, a maybe an overly diverse or a sort of too, just too much multiculturalism is going to create a kind of, you know, sort of ghetto dynamics and, and, um, a, a, and tension and, and, and so on. So, I, I, yeah, I, it, it, it's very difficult. I mean, it's true that the universities are becoming multiversities in the sense that they are much more siloed in their different academic, you know, different dis disciplines and sub-disciplines and sub-sub-disciplines. And so it's much harder than it used to be to kind of to talk across. There's a lot of talk about interdisciplinarity, but, uh, on, you know, for the most part, it's a dialogue of the deaf, it seems to me. Hmm. And it's very difficult to overcome that. Kathleen? Yeah, for me, the, the multicultural is multiculturalism issue isn't the biggest one in universities. It's more about the um, gradual sort of... Um, uh, ascent of uh, people that work in universities off the planet uh, through uh, financial insulation. Or, mm. I mean, not the students and not people uh, who are very precarious, but like the average academic has very little contact with the mm. political views of people they don't like mm. and, can, and can do that quite easily because they block them all on Twitter and they only ever go to seminars with people that agree with them politically mm. and they get this real confidence in their views. I mean, they're mm. genuinely astonished. And you can see it in the response in the university mm. section to Brexit. They were absolutely horrified, had no idea that was coming, could not see it at all because they were absolutely convinced everybody mm. thinks like them. So it's more about, you know, things like luxury beliefs, <laughs> you know, and status, status swapping across academics like what do you believe like what kind of status does these beliefs these very luxury beliefs niche beliefs give you mm. um then then I, I i just don't feel like that that's mm. the most pressing issue mm. okay we've got a question over here thank you very much fascinating discussion thank you very much uh, to all the panelists um we have an 18 year old son who's doing his a levels in the summer um all being well he'll head off to do computer studies at university next year um, what advice would you give to him? <laughs> it's a broad question. <laughs> That's just Any clues to what, what, sort what of direction? <laughs> you don't mean in the realm of computer studies? <laughs> <laughs> How should we have a better qualified audiences that? than this? No, in, in, ter in terms of keeping a... Uh, when all around you are losing their heads, <laughs> how, mm. how do you stay sane? Mm. I'll, I'll take that. So my advice would be in a classroom context, he needs to be careful about the opinions he voices. <laughs> and so you can mediate that to a certain extent by just saying, oh, I think this is a, a great idea, but what should I say if someone says X? And you actually believe X. So <laughs> that, that, that would be one way. So you need to be mindful about the kind of disagreements in and that's my advice in two voices. And then, I don't know, is it too late? Can he go to a voc vocational school? I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, but I also think it's very important in those friendships and those community groups that he, that he in, in which he finds himself, that he become an active participant in those. And so a lot of people derive most of their meaning from communal relations. And you can insulate yourself from ideology to a certain extent by engaging in non-ideological activities with others, so, I don't know, jujitsu or whatever, whatever it is. But I think that the, the larger question, the larger th issue is as he navigates those contentious, those turbulent waters, to just be mindful and thoughtful about the kind of st kinds of statements he makes within the context of the class. Mm -hmm. I, I want to attempt a vote here. I, I'm trying to work out what the, the fundamental question is. And it seems to me it's actually, in the discussions we've had, 
what sort of reaction there should be, what kind of approach will best try to fix this problem. I feel like there's a polite version, almost, which retains faith in the liberal settlement, thinks that universities should be neutral, and feels like the law, the media, creating new pan campaign groups, etc., will fix this problem. Let's call that the polite approach. <laughs> Um, I <laughs> confess, you might be unsurprised here, that I still have some faith in that that might eventually work. Uh, what we're doing here tonight is the kind of polite way to try and change the world. And then there's the more radical way, uh, and I think Pete sort of has exemplified that this evening, which is, and a lot of people believe that, and I don't disrespect them for that, which is the problem has got so bad now, there's no time for politeness anymore. There's no time, and actually... It, it won't work. It will take too long. The, 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 the rot is too deep. And therefore, there needs to be activist political recapture of those institutions, or indeed throwing them out altogether and starting again. So I just, I don't know if I've summarized them reasonably, but having heard what I said, raise your hand if you feel like the polite liberal approach is going to fix the universities. Okay, it's not, it's not, not, not insignificant. My mother is here, so she voted for me. <laughs> uh, I would say there's about 20 hands raised. Raise your hand if you, if you don't buy that and you think we need to be more, more radical. It's pretty evenly divided, but I would say that second group is the larger one. So, Pete, yeah. you are in the ascendant here. I, I will say on that note is you, you can have both. You, and I agree with James entirely. This is not a minor undertaking. This is a very significant expensive, time-consuming undertaking. But if even, I, look at, I liken it to a restaurant row. So if there are a bunch of restaurants in a row, people will go to that area. So it could be that if you have alternative educational infrastructures in which they actually are truth-driven, they're based upon rigorous, maybe even traditional scholarship, this is alternative institutions. Yeah, alternative yeah. institutions. Yeah. I would argue that that would be, be better for the, the, the traditional university systems. Mm. I mean, it seems obvious to me. But I acknowledge your point entirely that this is not a minor undertaking. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. Ka Kathleen, where, where have you ended up on, on that question? Well, I'm with the first lot, obviously. <laughs> I wish I was with the second lot, but I'm not. I'm afraid I'm reasonable and polite. Mm. <laughs> and making a big difference, dare I say it through that well, maybe, I don't know. Mm. Um. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Go on, we give you back. Freddie, <laughs> Freddie, yes. it's interesting to note when you said <laughs> that you're making a difference here at Unheard. I agree with you completely. But what's really interesting about that is that this is not a university setting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? right? So podcasts are very popular. Your podcast is great. I'm a subscriber. Podcasts are very popular, and people are hungry. For, I mean, the first the first line of Aristotle's Ethics are, you know, people want to know. Mm -hmm. People people want to, and they're not getting those mm -hmm. conversations. They're not getting that. They're not being challenged. And so, I would argue that that is part of the success of Unheard. They're coming mm -hmm. here because they want that, mm -hmm. and. Paradoxically, almost, as the universities adopt more traditional missions of having people debate and discuss, maybe the, un the unheard, um, I don't know, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I certainly hope that's not the case, but mm. it is interesting that your comment is true, you are doing that at unheard, mm. and you're doing that out of the university. Yeah. Unheard Academy, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to actually uh, leave it there because we always... Uh, end at exactly 8.30, so everyone knows when these things end. Um, the restaurant is open downstairs. The bar is open in there. Do please stick around and continue the conversation. But in the meantime, let me say a huge, huge thank you to our three brilliant panellists. <laughs> for a fascinating